Good evening, everybody. I'm glad you made it to the very last session, the last hour of the conference. Um, I know it's been a full day. Uh, I can promise you that I will not be bombarding you with a lot of like facts or knowledge that you need to capture and, and, and sort of write down. It will be more of a colloquial type of thing, you know, discussion. I'll be happy to take uh, questions and, and try to, um, you know, engage in discussion. So my name is Ivan Krylov. I am a senior software engineer, engineer uh, at, at, at Apple. Uh, I'm not a developer advocate. I, I'm not really that great at speaking. I don't really get to talk all that often. Um, however, that said, I, you know, this is my community talk. This is not something that kind of the company sent me to do. It's not really endorsed, but uh, it's kind of my own thing. Um, now. Now, it's, many of you have seen the great presentation about uh, Java at Microsoft, and I only wish I could uh, do something like that maybe some other year. Um, but if we came here to learn about you know, Java at Apple, I, unfortunately, that, it's not the, what's going to be right now. Um, however, if that question is burning you, what is Apple doing at Java Conference, um, then there's a website, careersapple.com. Just search for word Java and see hundreds of openings there, and that might give you a clue and a glimpse of, you know, an idea of the the variety and uh, distribution of projects that uh, that use Java. So Java is Java is important. All right. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's go. I have a clicker. All right. So I'm going to be talking to kind of I'm hoping that the audience mainly consists of developers, um, and I'll be I'll be taking actually a very enterprisey kind of approach. Uh, uh, when, when talk about this, so what I will be focusing on is not so much the new features that are emerging between 11 and 17, but rather about you know what what breaks and, and what are the other considerations that you might want to do. However, I will still cover the API changes, our review of them, um, and we'll sp speak about the JVM improvements and and and, and changes under hood. Um, so I, I actually worked, um, something that happened last hour, uh, there was a poll I didn't actually know about, but it was, it was running about the, the number of people that are running various versions. So there are simply still, still people, according to the poll of this conference, that's still running on Java 7. There are some uh, that are running on Java 8. More people, though, running production on Java 11. Um, there is, uh, jumping from 8 to 11 is, is a different topic. It's a different story. It's, uh, it's much more complex. So, so that's why I decided to leave it out. Uh, kind of under the premises that most, you know, the, actually not the most, but most people running our uh, Java 11 and are considering to move to 17. And that's why, you know, I scoped it that. Why not 19? Well, it's because of the LTS uh, versions that I'll be talking about in, in a little bit. Now, the other important part is that this uh, hopefully gives some information for tech leads that, uh, that, that will, will be talking to managers um, in presenting this task. Look, we have Java 11 in production running, and we need to move to 17. So I can imagine, um, let's, let's picture that you are uh, a tech lead, and I'm a manager, and you come to me and say, I need to dedicate several uh, men weeks, maybe a couple men months, um, to move our application, application X, to Java 17. And I would say, OK, what, what's your plan? And you'll say, well, our plan is, of course, look at dependencies. We will investigate which, which ones we need to update in order to be compatible with Java 17. And then we, of course, test. And, and we do performance testing. We do correctness testing. That's most important. Then we change our code. Whatever is not compatible, we'll change our code, You know, be compliant with 17. Again, correctness test, performance test. And then we we'll swap the runtime to 17 and do that all over again. So there's a lot of work, you know, it, it, it will take time. It won't be like overnight. And I say, okay, uh, sounds like a good plan. Now, what's the situation now? And you might say, well, we are running currently on Java 11, and all tests are green, all our metrics are good, customers are happy, we meet SLAs. At this point, I, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a greedy manager, might say, well, why the hell do you want me to invest this much time into migrating to Java 17? And the answer to that, it kind of is longish. Um, it's good if you have actual performance problems, or maybe you have done some calculations, and you've, you've done some little bit of performance analysis, and say, look, we can save 10% uh, of instances on AWS, and then you, you do the math, and that translates into some amount of dollars. 
or whatever is your platform, cloud platform of choice, GCP, it doesn't matter, uh, or on-prem machines. So that's one. But um, I, I, will, I will share, you know, your next few little slides. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about risks, and, uh, and hopefully that is actually a good motivation. That's actually a motivation of why changing things, even if the, applica the application that you are running on um, is not really in active development. It serves customers, but there's no active development, so it kind of sits there, it runs, but it will not run really forever, likely, um, in, in a good way. It, you know, eventually, it will need attention. So, yeah, uh, so if you will be having this sort of conversation um, and you need to build up some, some, some facts and some information in order to have that, that sort of talk. So I'm going to talk about relevance, and this is my personal kind of opinion. Um, uh, I, you know, I've been doing JVMs for, um, a year, uh, for, for about 15 or 17 years and, and been observing various mail lists. And I know that what is most relevant to JDK community, um, not, a, not the one at large, not the users, but the developers, the people that actually make JDK, primarily you know, Oracle and, and contributors from everywhere, is they all mostly care about the latest. So if you found an issue in your, that you, you think the issue is not your application, that the issue is with the platform, maybe a file system isn't supported, some permissions are wrong, whatever it is, they will tell you, first of all, well, so now GA version is 18, 19 is a month ahead, right? So 18, tell me, can you reproduce this issue on Java 18? And if so, this will get uh, an immediate attention, likely, and, 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 and somebody from the platform, um, either the or the community, will jump onto it. Similar with 17, because 17 is LTS, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, then 11. So you already see the pattern that you've discovered a problem. Maybe you haven't seen it before. Maybe because you, sweep, you swapped, let's say, hardware. You used to you know, run your old Rust application on some hardware, then time came to, to upgrade. You switched to a new CPU, and maybe that's CPU dependent. Maybe it's something security related. I'll be talking a little bit about security things. So the relevance here is really about how much, how interested is the community of developers in listening to the problem that you discovered on Java version X. And that's the situation right now, uh, you know, as, we, as we speak, uh, summer 2022. Now fast forward, let's say, a year from, from now, or a little over. Um, Java 21, as far as I hear, it's gonna be the, late, uh, the next LTS release. So, already, that's, that's the next one. 17 previous LTS release, a lot of people will be on that previous LTS release. But it's already, you can see that JDK 11 is going down. G I, by the way, I put there JDK 19, though, which is not even released, it's already going down, because it's a short-term release. So you see the pattern. The longer you stay on this outdated, and I put GDK 8 there in what I would call Valhalla of GDKs. Right? And so <laughs> it's sort of like you really have to pay a lot of money to your GDK vendor to, to fix those things, uh, or at least some amount of money that you have to fix. And, and you know, asterisk there, that's my opinion. That, that's, that's never declared anywhere on, on, on Open GDK website and, and so forth. So feel free to challenge me on this opinion. But anyway, so. That is problem number one. Now, uh, I mentioned before that um, I'm, I, I, the topic is about moving to 17 and not 18 and not 19 in, in exactly two months that, that will be released in. So, okay, this is, this is a terrible picture, but <laughs> bear with me, I'll explain what it is. Um, the, um, so I can imagine there are two scenarios of the projects that you're working on. So the blue thing, so this is a project with fast release. This is very common for if you're, you're running custom software. Let's say your customer is a bank, and you have so this production software, you roll updates, maybe every sprint, maybe however your sprint is long. You do it frequently, and as an as a application writer, you control the runtime, so you get to decide which Java version you want to run on. The red thing is kind of a time span of support of the LTS release, and the yellow ones are a time span of a GA release, like 12, 13, 14, and the above mentioned uh, Java uh, 18. That's actually, it's, that's not on the chart, but anyway. Um, what I mean by this yellow support thing, the support is, is vendor dependent. If you really need support, you need to sign up a contract with one of the vendors, and then they, 
um, and, and, and that's how you can you file an issue, there's this bug filed and somebody has a SLA, you know, when to respond. But when you are in the time scope between this next release, let's say JDK 16 came out, and for the next uh, six months, you have this privilege to get essentially a free support. You can go on the mail list, escalate your problem, and if the problem is indeed with the, with the platform, uh, most likely it will get attention, as, as I was speaking on the previous slide. Now, if you're stayed on something like GDK 12 now, then nobody's really interested. Everybody's like, well, GDK 12 is dead by now. I mean, 11, okay, so people use it. Eight, people still use it. 12 is dead. Nobody will listen to you to go and fix. Now, th this is very vendor dependent. For example, Azul has this notion of midterm support, so where they, you know, for 13 and 15, they extend the period. So on 12, you can get support, but for 13 and 15, you can get support. That's sort of to help these transition. This is a very much a kind of marketing slash vendor dependent story, depending on which vendor you talk to. But again, if we're talking about kind of free, and a lot of folks run Java, they don't really have a uh, vendor, uh, you know, support contract in place, to be honest. Now, this is an important picture to remember. So when you have these frequent releases, that means that for any particular sprint, you can schedule um, this task, or what I was just telling you about, you know, over, overview dependencies, then uh, upgrade your own code, and then change runtime. You can do it within the scope of one or two sprints or so, and that will still fit, you know, I assume the sprints are, are, are quick and, and rapid. You can, you can follow with the GA release. You can run, um, you know, whatever GA release, you know, not, you know, so 19 will come out, it will, it will schedule a, a sprint, and adopt it, and in, in a month or so, or maybe less than so, you'll be running on Java 19, especially given how easy it is compared to how it was from 8 to 11. So that is one possibility, and I've seen those examples as well. I, I, I very well know production systems that do exactly that. They, they adopt every new release, just like that. Now, there is another scenario that maybe you are writing, let's call it a platform. Um, Something that may have major, a notion of major and minor releases. Um, it can be for various reasons. One of the non, not less obvious one, but comes comes to my mind, is let's say certification. If you have, oftentimes when the way that software certification works is that uh, you you bring the ma next major uh, soft version of software, you're certified with the institution that you're certified with. You might be able to roll down minor uh, updates on top of it. It will still be certified. But at that point, you also freeze the operating system version, uh, the, aka the major operating system version, and you freeze the Java uh, kind of Java runtime version as well. You, you don't really move on. And since you can't be doing this often, you need this lifespan of how long your customers sit on. Um, this may very well be way above uh, six months. And so in this case, you don't really get this lever. You can't really use the, ye the, the, the yellow you know, steps. You can't really do this often. Your only option in this case is to stay on LTS releases, and you probably, you probably figured that. So 11 was previous LTS, and now it's, it's 17. The next one will be 21, according to the existing schedule. So these are the two scenarios that I can think of. Um, so. Now, we talked a little bit about risks, and we talked a little bit about why staying on LTS versions, uh, deploying on LTS versions, especially, you know, in that sort of situation. Now, let's talk a little bit about dependency. And again, so <laughs> I didn't want to pick up on any particular library. Um, it, that's why I put it kind of obscured dependency X, dependency Y. But uh, you, you have a bunch of dependencies in your project, most likely. So something like, well, Dimitri was talking about Helidon. So Helidon, if I remember 2.4, uh, is the first uh, version of Helidon framework that requires Java 17. And in Helidon 3, they will actually drop um, support for JDK 11. So it will run only on 17. Um, by the way, sometimes when you want to adopt a new framework, a new dependency, if it delivers new features, that's all yet another motivation for you to move forward. Something like Spring 6. Yeah. Spring 6 requires you to run 17. and if you want to stay on runtime 11, that means uh, that's version 5.3, I believe that. That has a fairly long and extended support lifetime. Uh, you know, we can talk, I, I actually somewhere have a list of uh, you know, Spark, Hadoop, um, uh, Kafka, you know, support lives. They are all varying. But ideally, you would want to find a, a version of dependency that supports your, let's say, 11 that you are running on and 17. 
And if, if, if that upgrade is required, you do that, and then you test fun functionality, you, just, you test performance, and, and if it's all good, then you've done you have one dependency upgrade, and then you f go to the next dependency, however you have, how many you have them, and that's your plan about dependencies. So that's the first thing that you do. You don't really yet upgrade at runtime. You, you, up, you look at the dependencies and change, and change those. Hopefully, because 17 has been released, what, about a year ago, most libraries uh, have declared, um, you know, have released versions that already support the 17 runtime, with the one obvious exception, I think, of Cassandra. I think Cassandra, uh, even if 4.0, still requires 11, and they don't really have a word about when 17 is going to be supported. So there can be situations where you're still blocked uh, on dependency, and you cannot, um, you cannot move on. Um, at this point, it's very good to talk to the vendor of that, of that library and, and ask what the hell, you know, what, 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 how can we move forward? Now, the next thing is, will be the breaking changes. So you will be eventually moving the, to over to, to 17, and things may break, and it may still bitter from the past experience of 8 to 11, where a lot of things were, were broken. And I tried very hard to enumerate uh, what can break, and there aren't too many things, to be honest. So should not be afraid. Uh, Nesthorn JavaScript has been, has been removed. Now, it's not that Java is a such a great platform to run JavaScript, but on occasion, it was just very convenient to run right there on the same Java virtual machine, your, your script. Now, you can go um, and load it now as external dependencies, it's just not packaged with the JDK itself. Solaris and Spark ports are removed. I, can't, I don't know if the story if they're available commercially, but at least kind of in the open JDK uh, and, and main vendor distributions that are out there, you cannot get them. So uh, in, if in by chance you have in your lab, in your, um, in your, in your, um, in your deployment, if you're using that hardware, you might have to switch hardware because you won't get 17 at least for free. There are some minor packages and classes that are being removed, but we kind of utility ones. It's more of a cleanup inside of a GDK. Um, there are things that are called deprecated. You can still use them, but they are declared deprecated. So that's kind of like you may ignore those warning messages, like something like applet API is, is, is deprecated. But that means uh, you're, you're accumulating technical depth. So, do you want to accumulate technical depth? That's a, that's a very kind of religious question, I guess, uh, depending on where you are with your project. Um, there are some other minor, so there are great um, resources. Um, there's a, I believe there's a resource, at FoodJ there is a page regarding how you can compare uh, APIs uh, from different versions. There is one, I think, that Chris Newland uh, runs. But you can basically compare uh, versions and, and what changed. And, I, and I, that's what I did. And I, and I looked through what are the changes in API method met, methods. And very few, you know, between 8 and 11, a lot of things moved between packages. And, and you would just frequently get class not found uh, exception. Um, with, with, with between 11 and 17, we have, you know, there's a decoder um, constructor method removed, but probably you didn't use it. You just, there's a static uh, factor there. A uh, bunch of AWT and Swing classes just cha changed the uh, visibility attributes, so you don't call them directly anymore. Um, there are some finalizers that are being removed. You probably heard at other talks that finalizers overall from the language uh, kind of s trying to be removed altogether, and the first thing, and rightfully so, the, the Java platform team does is, is getting rid of our finalizers um, in own class libraries. Security is probably the most important thing. Now, maybe that's just uh, kind of my, my background, where I'm right now, but on one hand, security is kind of hard to sell. On the other hand, if because of a security flaw, you breach, um, well, not you, but if the, if the data becomes accessed you know, in an illegal manner and, and, it, and it flows, that can be devastating to business, you know, subject to you know, all, sorts of, all sorts of consequences. So um, security, staying on top of security is, is very important, and that's by migrating timely to the next JDK version, it helps you to stay on top of security changes. Uh, so I try to list a few of those. Um, the, so root certificates, they can constantly change. Um, and that actually happens also, also in minor releases. And the reason why that is important is that if you have some clients you know, talking to your servers, 
that are not updated, they are cut off of internet and somehow don't get updates that eventually, you know, you may not be able to find common word certificates, right? The most important one is out of this list, uh, I guess, uh, from the migration perspective is the uh, elimination of illegal access option. So illegal access option is sort of a kill switch. So when, when many of you, when you were migrating from 8 to 11, you saw those class not found um, exceptions and you figured, um, well, I really should do add, add reads and add, um, what is that one? Add reads and adds open, adds open yeah. uh, option. But I'm in a rush, I'm out of time. I'm gonna just throw this, this kill option, illegal access. It will fix all my problems right there. Uh, but in 17, it will be gone. Um, so you, that, that's a technical depth that you have to resolve now. Uh, what it means to you is that you go get grep, if you're using git, uh, grep your sources for this very line, and if it's there, that you, you know you have an item, you have there a, a sprint item there to, to fix it, if you're using sprint. Um, there's a bunch of changes in kind of various underlying algorithms. Some became non-default, like the elliptic curve, elliptic curve um, um, not being the default in the TLS algorithms. Um, the native uh, Sunny C implementation is no longer default. Um, so if you're using some various defaults, you know, those change. Um, something that logically maybe should have been on the previous slide, but security manager is deprecated as well. You, you'll start getting warnings. Uh, that's more like when you start recompiling your code with 17, you will see those warnings. Um, a couple of um, RMI activation and, 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 and security AC, ACL package are being removed. Now, the last one, TLS 1.0.1, you know, how many people were bit by this, uh, by this up change? I, I wonder if, if anybody. So I definitely know quite a, quite a number of people who came to me and, and they said something like this. We wanted to migrate from 11 to 17 and our client can no longer talk to a server. And I, and I said, okay, tell, give, me, give me, let's start with the, with the simple things. Give me a version. It turns out that they were like 11.05 and they were moving to, uh, to 17 GA. The thing is that, um, well, in this particular case, TLS 1.0, 1.1 became unavailable. There are tutorials on how to configure so that they become available again, but, but by default, they are not available. So the, the TLS, TLS of these older versions cannot be, cannot be used in a default configuration to, to connect between client and server. Uh, the lesson learned here is that if you are migrating from 11 to 17, do, the, do, the, do a favor yourself and move to the latest update of Java 11. So I believe today, uh, Oracle and others will be releasing update 16, so that's your target. <laughs> Up until now, update 15 of JDK 11. Move there, uh, make sure everything works, and, and then you can kind of continue on with the migration work towards 17. So very important, move first to the latest update of the existing uh, LTS 11, therefore, and then move to, to 17. In the VM, oh, that's a very dear topic to my heart, um, Graal, uh, so there were very few changes. Uh, the first one is that Graal VM is no longer bundled. You can still get Graal, you, you, can, you, you just go to the Graal website and, and download OpenJDK from there, but in JDK 11, what happened is in JDK 11, they introduced this um, enable experimental JIT, and you could enable Graal there. The problem was that it was not all that frequently updated, and therefore, eventually, the platform team decided that uh, whoever wants to use Graaljit need to get it elsewhere, uh, such that they get the latest and greatest. It's not bundled by default. Uh, the second one is actually a very big one. Uh, there are lots of customers for CMS, particularly because in the old days, you know, like Java 7, Java 8, it was, it was hard to tune. But once you tune it, you, get, you probably get the best um, the best kind of latency characteristics um, from your JVM. And even though Shenandoah and ZGC have come a long way, um, CMS is still widely used and, and, and it, it's, it's quite noticeable. And I know teams and I know projects that are, you know, they, it's harder for them to kind of pass by this one. The third one on the bias locking removal, uh, well, it's deprecated now. It can still enable, but it's already off by default. So bias locking is a little trick that JVM does when, when there is a con there's a low contention on an object, 
um, and the fast path of acquiring a lock on an object is a quick one, and the bias locking is kind of sh giving this bias towards a particular thread. Um, most, most measurements uh, show that bias locking is not really a big factor and therefore can be disregarded, but there can be some corner cases where it can. So since it's still available uh, in 17, if you suspect a performance issue, that's one of the things to try, try to, to, to enable back bias locking. And, but, it's, but to notice performance issue of a, of a bias, um, of bias log locking being not available, it's, it's kind of a tricky thing. You're really in the kind of deep into performance tuning at this point. There are a few uh, new features. Now the CMS is gone. ZGC got really good. So ZGC is available from, actually from GDK 11 as an experimental garbage collector. Now if there's one thing to remember from this talk, <laughs> do not use ZGC in production if you're still using GDK 11. Um, there are known issues, not fixed. Do not, uh, if you want to use GGC, it's a great collector. Go straight to GDK 17. But, but if you do need a low pass collector with open GDK, Shenandoah has been doing a terrific job of not only like developing the collector and it's, it's nice and shining in 17, but they also were very good at backporting all the features uh, into 11. So while on surface, ZGC and Shenandoah um, kind of are addressing the same problem, the problem of latency. The way that the source code is maintained, the way that updates are managed is dramatically different, in my opinion, uh, between the two kind of teams. So, so be aware of that. Um, something that happened with a number of garbage collectors, several of them, uh, you know, different times, is about unused memory being released and given back to the OS. That's kind of important if you have other processes besides your JVM on, on the machine. Most folks tend to run JVM per, per, per server, and, and therefore they don't necessarily uh, care if it was released and then was reacquired again. Uh, but that's something to be uh, uh, aware of. There were many improvements. So J1 doesn't get all that much love in uh, conference talks because you know, J1 appeared a long time ago. There were incremental smaller changes here and there. But actually, there were a lot of things that happened in, in, in the past three years, um, like abortable collections, which uh, helped to help to meet the, the, the target that you were, um, they were looking at. By the way, I, I don't really have a counter. I have no idea how much time I do have left. Um, and, uh, um, and across all collectors, G1 included, there was a, a great effort of trying to do as many operations concurrent as possible. And concurrent means that your Java application keeps on running, albeit maybe a bit slower, while GC doing its background work. So these are great. You get that. The, you get the stuff for free, except for the CMS is gone. So you you kind of have to make. The thing is that CMS is gone. So, well, a you get this option. You get this error message if you try to enable CMS. CMS and b, the default collector is G1. Um, and maybe if you're targeting low latency kind of uh, scenarios, you need to select Shenandoah or ZGC to go forward. Um, so I mentioned that GraalVM is out. Um, out of the door. Now that's C2 collector has been out there for two decades or more, uh, and they are still still kick the butt. You know they're still really doing a great job. And some of the things that I've learned from the Graal code base is that inlining is actually very important. And so they've done a, a great job of tuning and making inlining better. Inlining unlocks a whole bunch of other optimizations that now become that now are available to a wider scope. Um, in terms of uh, methods being compiled and all the methods that are being called from the method being compiled. And so C2, while it isn't really kind of hyped and it's not really, it's not really mentioned all that often, is getting a lot of improvements. On the runtime, um, besides the elastic metaspace, uh, that's also a way of giving back uh, uh, memory back to OS, the biggest changes that I recall are about the class data sharing archives that I think they were, were mentioned at least once or twice during, during early talks today. So I will not dive into those, but it's a way to improve startup. Um, the speaker at the, of, the, of the relevant session said that, uh, it was you or not, I think, um, that he, he could observe like 10% improvement on startup time. Um, and while the feature has been evolving over time, it's now that it's actually so easy to use that it's almost like a free lunch, free, free thing in terms of improving their startup. Uh, on the serviceability side, JFR is 
uh, in my view, it's becoming like de facto standard in terms of uh, monitoring and uh, collecting data on what's actually happening to a Java virtual machine underneath. And that the main thing that happened there is addition of streaming events. Um, keep on talking about security every now and there. Um, so the context-specific deserialization filters that were added, I um, can't remember which version, but between, between 10 and 17, is an important feature that if you used it properly, um, might have prevented things like Lock4j, you know, the, the lock, lock for, lock for shell attack um, that was exposed, what is it, November, December last year? A uh, pretty big thing. Um, while the uh, deserialization filter existed before, um, it's the, the, the ability to, do, to tailor them to a specific context where deserialization happens uh, and not conflicting with the global setting, but rather augmenting it uh, you know, locally at, at the place of deserialization plus the global facts that really help you to make those changes, the, those, to make um, deserialization more secure. And that's yet one another layer, one another kind of barrier towards the attacks. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be updating Log4j. Sure, uh, you know, hopefully all of you have done that if you, are, if you are responsible for particular deployment. But that, you know, things like that can happen. And so deserialization is, uh, is an important attack vector that you need to be uh, aware of. Um, security is a, an evolving topic, and there are various algorithms come up. Um, so the Edwards curve uh, signature signatures were added, SHA-3, um, uh, hashing added to a bunch of different algorithms. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the you know root certificates, uh, so the, especially the ones with the one um, 1,024-bit keys were removed and replaced by new ones. And uh, Nikolai Parlik mentioned it uh, during his talk uh, an hour ago, and I would like to stress that that you know if Sean Mullen is is listening from Oracle Group, uh, from from Java Group, um, you know. Uh, Thanks so much for doing this blog. Has one post per major Java release where he explains everything that happened and kind of in security you know, space and what what are the changes in in the there. So this is the this is the link I highly recommend you to follow with every Java release. You know you, you can get the, can idea what happened. There were changes in the random number generators. They are not really all that noticeable to you because the APIs largely stay the same, but. Um, these, the algorithms underneath have approved, and I try to make sense of like the changes in terms of the kind of class and class, classes are um, kind of in a dark red and, and interfaces are in a in magenta color here, um, and try to make sense of the, of the new uh, structure of code that's in, in JDK. But the bottom line is that while we as developers often think of like, look, where do we use random, random generators? Maybe tests. We want them to be random, but not too random, or we don't care how random they are. But if you think about things like um, authentication of purchases, you know, you, you, you go online and then you get this one-time code um, and, and you use that one to authenticate your purchase. And so if those random sequences can be guessed, that's a, that's a problem. Uh, that's a major security problem. And so therefore, I really appreciate the work that the guys are doing in terms of improving and adopting better algorithms for pseudo, that's still pseudo, random generation. And at last, uh, GDK features. Now, Billy, uh, Billy Osormo there, gave a, a brilliant presentation yesterday covering, covering the various uh, GDK features. I will step over them. And that's, a, by the way, that's a, that's, what, that's a, yet another observation. So Java, Java um, platform group people make a great job of advertising features that have been released, language features that have been released. And then you go and you know, what happened between release X and Y, these are the new features. Even a better job of talking about features that haven't been released but probably will be um, in, 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 in some time in the future. But uh, from the pragmatic perspective, uh, it, when we talk about migration from 11 to 17, this is the least important topic, but still, uh, you know, I will outline, because helpful NPEs are actually very important to, to identify um, the, the, the places and, you know, quickly see where exception came from. Um, I will, um, yeah, for hidden class, I have a separate class uh, slide. Um, there is a new JVM API for constants and a, a way to eliminate some of the ugly hacks that exist in the code and instead do a proper API calls. Um, there's support for um, for NVM uh, memory um, in map, uh, byte buffer, which is 
which is important. For me. How much time do I have? I have six stuff. Still have time. Um, uh, the uh, network APIs have been largely rewritten, rewritten. Again, that's something that you know you on API level you don't really notice, but uh, you will notice hopefully the performance of that. And the on the macOS side, uh, this this adoption of the Metal API rendering for all of you who are using uh, Macs um, and, and do graphics in Java on macOS, that you will notice that. Otherwise, not. Uh, there's only like five or six language features that happen in between these re these releases, uh, the seal classes, and I'll, I'll actually have a slide for each. For, for seal classes, that's something that as an application developer you don't really notice, but uh, maybe if you're developing um, a library and you want to constrain on which classes can be uh, you know, extended, um, there are Existing, there are very few existing options. You know, you can declare your class to be not extendable, like by final. You can do tricks like private constructors. Uh, you can put them uh, in a package. You know, put declare you know package private, so that's not exposed outside of package. Uh, but uh, language designers thought that this is not really exhausting and, and, and all com not comprehending all the situations. So instead, they create uh, they added this feature of declaring cl class a sealed one, where you basically declare which classes can. And it can extend, you know. In my case, this ACI engine it can only be petrol diesel. There, there is no third type of, of engine of this type. So, so there's a simple example there. Um, switch expressions have got a lot of love uh, with JEP 361, uh, um, and there are many corner cases. And Billy, I think, talk, talked about some of those. Um, I try to create a kind of an all comprehensive example. You know, there's. Uh, possibility of a bug with mean, a fall through a kind of um, pattern that you see a lot. Um, it's very nice when you can uh, convert your switch expression into a, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the statement into, a sp into expression and assign a value like it's done on the right hand side. Um, the lambda type, lambda style syntax looks, also looks, looks, looks very nice. So um, it's a well covered topic. Once you are on to Java 17 runtime uh, and you do the job of revisiting code and cleaning up, it might be a good opportunity. Although, on the other hand, mentors barely appreciate you going back to code and doing a cleanup. So maybe it's, maybe you start using it in tests at least, um, and then later on, you know, adopt into the mainline code. Uh, better instance off. Okay, and it's another thing that allows you to write. I, I'm pretty sure you probably you'll not have time to go and revisit all your code and and, and and do this sort of transformation. But on on slide, it looks great. You know, you, you reduced uh, uh, the complexity of reading this code, and and uh, you no, know, you could fit in additional you know condition right there in the if statement. It looks cleaner, nicer. The language is evolving. It's all good to observe. From the migration uh, standpoint, it's not really that important. There you have it. Text box is actually something really cool. I, I, I enjoy and I love it a lot. You've probably seen some, well, there was an example uh, on JSON. I'm giving you here an HTML example. It comes directly from the JEP itself. And, um, and again, it helps you to, to, to make your sources cleaner, easier to maintain, uh, bug free. But it's all for, for new code. Um, finally, on the records class, uh, again, the example given straight from the job. So if you want to write a uh, standard, standard 2D, 2D point, and you might need to create a kind of trivial and simple constructor, uh, getters, equals method, two string um, implementation, you know, hash code, all of that can be with records can be translated into a single kind of declaration. Now, the re now there are very good IDs out there. It's very easy to teach an ID, and I can, I'm not sure, but maybe ID already does this, where which would generate the code on the left for you. Now, the practical side of things is that I'm sure all of you do code reviews, and when a colleague sends you a a, a pull request to review, and and among, amongst other things, it's this declaration of class point. Now you start look, taking a good look at like, is this class doing what I think it should be doing? It does really have fields as private, getters as public, the fields are final. So by using something on the right hand right hand side is is great for just saves a lot of time on, on, on code reviews. You know, you like you understand the, the author really well. And that's and that's and that's the beauty of it, I guess. More than anything else. Otherwise, yeah, a bunch of IDs can generate something similar to you. 
or um, or maybe Lombok can do this as well. Um, so there are preview and incubating features um, that are listed here. Um, do not <laughs> use these in production. Do not code against them because look, you may be eager to try this new cool vector API. But if you try to put this into production code, uh, you know, thinking that you know, this is the version that I have in Java 17, and then you're being pulled to another project, somebody else comes in who doesn't really understand your code, and Vector API change uh, between, let's say, 17 and whatever is the next one, LTS 21, it would be a, a, a problem that you'll create right there on the spot. So um, sure, try uh, preview features, give feedback to authors, uh, but don't put them in production, um, no way. And uh, platforms is a big thing. Um, so between 11 and 17, uh, first of all, Alpine links, came, Alpine links support came, came about. And uh, kudos to, I think, Bellsoft guys who were driving this effort, which is great because people are using Alpine Linux all over the place, uh, primarily for Dockers. You know, Mix helps you to have those tiny images, which is great, cost saving, all that. Now, ARM64 got a lot of love uh, between 11 and 17. First, there was a unified port. So originally, that was a closed source, I believe, port that was uh, lived out there. And then Red Hat was relating like in the open. And there were two implementations of pretty much the same thing. And they managed to talk to each other and come up with something that's called the unified port, which is great. Um, so, and Graviton uh, leverages that. And you know, there were some additional ed support added for Graviton machines. and. And if you ever go to AWS events, the, you'll, you'll hear a lot about how good is Graviton. So that Graviton work support and, and ability to use it comes from this ARM64 Linux Unified Support, which is great. Now, uh, Windows was released for ARM pr pl platforms. And understandably, Microsoft can uh, contribute to this work. And we now can use um, Java on Windows on ARM. And then Mac OS was released on, Mac, on, on Apple Silicon, and this work was contributed by Microsoft, and, <laughs> and, and with a lot of help, or actually a lot of effort from Azul Systems. So as somebody who meets every single day people using Apple Silicon Macs, I really appreciate this work. Um, um, so thanks so much, Azul guys, Microsoft guys. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, later on, this was backported to 11, so you can actually it wasn't, it wasn't immediate, but by now you can actually download JDK 11 in, uh, and, 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 and ARM build builds and, and, and use that as well. But not JDK 8. If you're still, if you must use JDK 8, um, I, on macOS there's this thing called Rosetta 2, and it's remarkably efficient. You wouldn't really expect something called like an interpreter or, bike, uh, or, or, or instruction transformer uh, to be as efficient. It, uh, for everyday kind of like developer activities, um, if Java is running, uh, Intel, Intel-based instructions uh, running through Zeta on the ARM machine, they're, they're quite fast. Um, and it's only when you get to like running heavyweight uh, tests, um, then, um, then you really notice that actually I'm not really not writing, running native instruction. Also very, very robust. I've been using uh, Java via Rosetta for quite a few months, and I can say that it never really crashed on me. So it's pretty good. The metrics of the support metrics of platforms is now complete and on par for x86 and ARM, uh, which is great. Gives you a choice. What do you want to use? Do you want to use Intel machines on the server? Do you want to use Graviton ARM machines on the server side? You know what? 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 Plat what? What is? You know, you can get either kind of laptop uh, for your day-to-day -day work and be confident that you have your, all your tools, or at least all your Java-based tools available. Oh, that's, yeah, I mentioned before that Java platform group people do a great job of advertising features that have not been released yet. Um, so uh, things like Panama or Valhalla, I've heard about them several years back. And, and Java 17 LTS was released about a year ago. So if I'm kind of a bypasser, not paying very close attention to what, to what is where, I might have thought that by now we would have already Loom in 17, and I should start you know, experimenting with it. Maybe I would have Panama, uh, kind of, which bridges native and, 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 and Java code seamlessly, and, and Valhalla. All of this, by the way, covered, covered in great depth by Nikolai Parlog an hour ago. Uh, it was, I believe the session was recorded, so you can rewatch it if you didn't. So these are great topics. The, 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 part the, the message of this slide is that <laughs> these are still coming up. Some stuff is coming up in 19. Some stuff is coming later. 
Uh, pay, pay attention that these are not part of 17. We'll have to wait some more time. So, as we, we are leaving this room, the reason to migrate to Java 17 is not so much the, the nice and shiny language features that I talked about in the second half of this presentation. It's really about, it's about um, risk management, uh, who do you get support from, how timely is your support, how knowledgeable, how interested is the community that supports GDK as a platform in, in the bugs that you'll be, you'll, you'll be finding. Um, security, um, every aspect of security is very important and the later releases uh, come with embedded much better security features. Um, migration should be fairly painless. I, I tried to find the stumble points where you know, migration could, could fall in, the, except for that LTA, TLS bug that I was talking about earlier and a few other corner points. There's really not a lot that I can say, well, this will break and this will block you for, for a very long time. Now, I may be missing some of the cases, so feel free to tell me that. You need to know your dependencies. That's the biggest and most important part of migration. It's not really touching your code. It's about investigating how our dependencies doing. And unfortunately, there are still cases where dependencies are not up to date. They cannot run on 11. But in most cases, uh, it's already the case, and, and 17 is supported. You do get free lunch in terms of improved performance. Uh, if you can measure it, if you can translate this into a dollar amount, you can contribute that to that wonderful conversation with the manager. You can put this into your annual, I don't know if you guys do annual reviews, but you know, we, we completed migration to Java 17 and we saved X amount of dollars for our company. Will be great, you know, maybe you'll get an extra bonus for that. That's a motivation, isn't it? Um, IDs are up to date, yes. Uh, that, that, that in the past there were cases when you know, Java would come out and uh, uh, IDE would take time to catch up or, or NetBeans and all, all that history. Now it's a very good co collaboration between those teams and, and yeah, IDEs are supported as you are well aware. Um, the content is, uh, of releases is vendor specific, I must say that. For example, I mentioned that GraalVM JIT is no longer shipped with the GDK releases in general. But there are vendors out there, uh, namely Bellsoft, that they actually package GraalVM JIT, so, can, so if you must use it, that's, that's, that's also a possibility. So, so it's, it's, and, and there are other like cases like, case like that. For example, Oracle binaries for a long time were not shipping Shenandoah garbage culture. I'm not sure what the, what the story is as of, as of today. But other than there's we're, we're, we're shipping, so uh, you need to be aware that, well, while mostly OpenGDK is vanilla OpenGDK, it really matters where, who do you get the OpenGDK from. Um, and so be, pay attention to that. Um, yeah, uh, more, more platforms, more relevant platforms are being supported. Um, small improvements uh, on kind of for each individual platform that I a little bit touched upon. And with that, thank you very much. That's all I have to say today.